Welcome. I'm Margo Matwitek. I'm Director of Social Justice Studies at ELIC. I'd like to begin by acknowledging with respect the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples on whose unceded territory the university stands and whose historical relationship with the land continues to this day. I also want to acknowledge that for many Indigenous communities in British Columbia, true respect and acknowledgement will be strongly dependent upon the decisions we make in the future around issues of climate justice and fossil capitalism. It's my honor to introduce you this evening to Dr. Carroll. Uh, Small Bill, as some of us know him. Small B Bill? Small B Bill is what I meant to say, not Small Bill. <laughs> um, many of you in the community and on campus know him as the founding director of Social Justice Studies. I can't count the number of times in my first couple of years as director of SJS that people assumed I was just filling in for Bill and that he'd be back to the position shortly. SJS without Bill was somehow unimaginable. Bill's commitment to social justice studies goes back a long way. Soon after I arrived at UVic, almost 30 years ago, I met Bill when I was invited to be part of the committee formed by Rich Kailun, who sits back here, uh, from Continuing Studies, which was responsible for planning the social justice issues lecture series. Then Bill and I became part of another committee formed by Rich Kai, the Advisory Committee on Certificate Diploma Program in Social Action Research. The committee met for more than a year trying to bring to life a diploma program in social justice, social action studies. We weren't successful, but Bill didn't give up on the hope. It would be almost 10 years before Bill succeeded in bringing together a different group of dedicated scholars and community members to launch the minor and diploma program in SJS. We are very thankful for his, his perseverance. And I thank Bill as well for always being an ally and a role model to myself and to many other activists, academics on campus. For others, Bill is the critical sociologist with research interests in the political economy, ecology of corporate capitalism, social movements and social change, and critical social theory and method. He has at least 13 books to his name, including his most recent, Organizing a 1%, How Corporate Power Works. He was a founding participant in the Interdisciplinary Graduate Program in Cultural, Social, and Political Thought, and has been awarded the Canadian Sociology Association's John Porter Memorial Prize twice in 1988 for Corporate Power and Canadian Capitalism, and in 2006 for corporate power in a globalizing world. In, in 2008, he was awarded the University of Victoria Faculty of Social, Research, Social Sciences Research Excellence Award. And in, in 2012, he received another Social Sciences Excellence Award, this time for community outreach. In 2011, he received the Canadian Sociological Association's Outstanding Contribution Award for career achievements. Dr. Carroll was president of Economy and Society, a large research committee of the International Sociological Association, and currently serves on its executive committee. He is also vice president of ISA's Futures Research Committee and sits on 11 academic editorial boards. This is just a small sampling of Bill's many contributions and successes. Tonight, Bill will talk to us about the challenge of climate justice. Can we make a just transition from fossil capitalism? Please note that Bill's talk will be video recorded, uh, but we will end the recording before the question and answer period. The video will eventually be available on the SJS YouTube page. Welcome, Bill. Let me begin at an obvious starting point. The symptoms of climate crisis are abundant. And by now, many of us are familiar with the, the famous hockey stick graph, you know, showing the acceleration of average temperature since the late 18th century. And in general terms, we can agree with Naomi Klein that the culprit is capitalism. In fact, as Richard Heady, uh, founder of uh, 
the Climate Accountability Institute has shown, just 90 carbon majors are responsible for the lion's share of greenhouse gas emissions since the Industrial Revolution. These corporations are among the world's largest transnationals, including BP, uh, Shell, Chevron, the usual suspects. As many of us have observed, the logic of capitalism, endless growth based on private profit and an unplanned market system, entirely contradicts the way ecosystems function. In the latter case, there is a logic of interdependence, of countless species that have co-evolved to form a web of life. That ecosystem requires certain geological conditions, such as the right temperature, so that the living systems, including us, can thrive. There are many ways that capitalism is the enemy of nature, as Joel Covell put it. Before capitalism became truly globalized in the past several decades, these threats were felt locally, as in a single polluted river. As capitalism has scaled up, so have its ecological impacts. These include resource depletion, habitat destruction, mass extinction, and decline of living systems, including, um, uh, of course, global warming as, as another major kind of symptom, if you like. Now, as we know, capitalism has to grow to continue to be capitalism. But why is that the case? Well, the simple answer is that under capitalism, humanity's resources are controlled by a small class of major investors and top executives. These owners and senior managers of capital make up a capitalist class. After a century and a half of increasing corporate concentration, the major players worldwide have been reduced to a few hundred giant corporations, bearing their families, and financial institutions. Within this powerful but tiny class, there's an ongoing struggle to stay ahead of the competition. As each capitalist tries to maximize profit, he or she is compelled to reinvest much of the profit to grow the business or diversify into more profitable lines, to keep up with the competition. At the level of the system, this produces the well-known logic of endless growth. Capitalism's endless growth means that its ecological footprint is endlessly growing also. Now, as I've said, there are many interrelated consequences of this for the rest of nature. In this lecture, I'm going to focus on greenhouse gas emissions, the main driver of climate crisis. But blaming capitalism in the abstract does not get us very far and could lead us up some blind alleys, such as the paralysis of catastrophism. We need to understand how the process actually works as a regime of obstruction, blocking the kinds of changes to our life ways that could avoid the worst impact of an already unfolding climate crisis. And we need to get a grip on the actual alternatives. So first, I want to um, review how capitalism is implicated in the ever-increasing carbon emissions and climate change. Then I will present a framework for understanding how corporate power works, particularly in Canada, to protect revenue streams of big business. And finally, I'll outline an alternative to our form of oligarchic corporate power and fossil capitalism, what is called energy democracy, and some ideas on how we might move toward a socially just and ecologically responsible future. So to begin with fossil capitalism, so I, I want to unpack how fossil capital, that is the buried sunshine of coal, oil, and gas, which concentrate solar energy of past life forms into fossil fuel, how that's been integral to capitalist development. Fossil capital has been with us since the Industrial Revolution, as Andreas Malm has indicated in this book. The development of capitalism as a globally dominant way of life rested on carbon energy, which empowers capital to accumulate on an extended scale, but releases CO2 on the same scale, leading inevitably to climate crisis, in Malm's analysis. Jason Moore observes that capital has always boosted its profitability by appropriating what he calls cheap nature, Nature has been both tap and sink for capital, from beaver pelts in early colonial Canada to oil. Business has tapped 
nature's bounty. At the same time, nature has been a sink, absorbing capital's waste. A good example is the production and consumption of fracked natural gas, the form of fossil capital preferred by the BC government. Hydraulic fracturing involves underground injections of water and a mixture of sand and chemical additives. The tap in this case is the under, underground natural gas deposits as well as the water needed to force them up to the surface. The site of extraction is also a sink for pollutants, including polluted water that cannot be re recovered for human usage. The local impact of pollution from fracking can be very serious, but the atmosphere is also a sink for the methane that escapes during extraction and ultimately for the CO2 that is emitted as natural gas is burned. In the case of BC's Northeast, much of that natural gas is used either to power Alberta's tar sands or to dilute bitumen so that it can flow through pipelines, including potentially TMX, as Ben Parfit has shown. Fracking in BC is just one local example rich in hypocrisy, to be sure. Scaling up to the Earth system, as fossil capitalism globalizes more extensively, the sink overflows with greenhouse gases and other pollutants, and the tap starts to run dry, not only in deteriorating agricultural productivity or cheap food, but in depletion of high-grade oil, which provokes resort to extreme carbon, such as fracking, creating greater emissions and ecological risk. The treadmill of production spins out of control. Fossil capital has been deeply implicated also in the political and cultural forms of advanced capitalism. Tim Mitchell in Carbon Democracy notes ironically that from the 1870s on, quote, the age of democracy coincided with the age of empire. The rise of coal produced democracy at some sites and colonial domination at others. At the core of the world system, coal mining brought workers together at a key point in the commodity chain, enhancing their power and enabling the northern working class to demand concessions that led to carbon democracy. Well, what about more recent times? Fossil capital has developed persuasive means of hegemonic incorporation, which operate economically and ideologically. And in an astute case study of the United States as the epicenter of this way of life, Matthew Huber has explored how the hegemony of fossil capital was cemented in the post-World War II era with the rise of suburbanized consumerism. In consumer capitalism's golden years, as Huber notes, cars, single detached houses, and appliances energized segments of the working class, affording enormous power over machines, space, and everyday life. In this scenario, the individual experiences automobility as liberating, and um, the single detached house as a domain of personal sovereignty. One of the long-range results has been a constrained politics within narrow limits focused on the family, private property, and anti-collectivist sentiments, as Huber puts it, the stock and trade of neoliberalism. Most families, most people in our extended human family will never live the American dream of unbridled consumerism and automobility. Uh, you can't imagine seven billion people living that way. It's just ecologically not on. But even if the dream is a hoax, it continues to tug at the heartstrings and aspirations and poses a psychocultural barrier to climate justice. And the dream is not uniquely American. In its 2014 branding campaign to build support for the Northern Gateway Pipeline, Calgary-based Enbridge Corporation reminded us that life takes energy. And who can resist chocolate cupcakes with raspberries? <laughs> Meanwhile, what is corporate capital's preferred fix for the climate crisis? Mainly carbon trading, that is, to turn carbon emissions into a tradable commodity so that big business can continue to reap profits while depoliticizing global warming into technocratically guided individual choices by investors and consumers, making it 
more difficult even to see what the central issue of climate justice is, much less to take action, as Larry Lohman has put it. Fossil capital, of course, has not just been central to consumerism, suburbanization, automobility. It continues to be the chief form of energy in industrial production and transport. Other industries depend on an increasing supply of fossil fuels, and the financial sector is deeply implicated in funding carbon extraction, from the tar sands to deep water drilling, fracking, and other forms of extreme oil. And yet, the deepening crisis of global capitalism, evident, for instance, in declining sales growth, poses threats to the status quo. The current crisis has a dual character, economic and ecological. These have different dynamics, though. So um, barring an exit from capitalism, economic crisis is cyclical. Each bust prepares the conditions for the next boom. Ecological crisis names the cumulative degeneration of the Earth's living systems. Although fossil capital remains the prime mover of capitalist production worldwide, it is increasingly recognized as a legacy industry, as fossil corporations mount rearguard actions to block or slow sunsetting while hedging into renewables. Now this brings us to Canada. With the highest per capita emissions among the G20 states, Canada presents the interesting case of a climate laggard, and in some respects, a first world petrostate. Canada holds the world's third largest reserves of oil. But 97% of these are, as David Hughes puts, puts it, low quality oil sands that are energy and emissions intensive to extract and costly to refine. Although jobs directly in the fossil capital sector account for a, a tiny fraction of the national workforce, and although state revenues from that sector have plunged in recent years to negligible levels, political and corporate leadership is solidly behind a slightly modified business as usual, with carbon extraction continuing to increase even as other measures partly mitigate those, new, those further emissions. Twelve years after Stephen Harper declared Canada an energy superpower, a bloated oil and gas sector centered upon the tar sands is integral to capitalism in Canada. Now, in these circumstances, a regime of obstruction with a distinctive political economic architecture has taken shape. This regime is constituted through modalities of power that protect fossil capital revenue streams while bolstering public support for massive additional investment, as in new pipelines. The regime incorporates a panoply of hegemonic practices at different scales and reaches into civil society and political society and into indigenous communities whose land claims and worldviews challenge state-mandated property rights. Now, since 2015, I've been academic director of the Corporate Mapping Project, seven-year collaborative investigation centered on the case of Canada. Co-directed by Shannon Dobb of the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, our project combines social science inquiry with popular education and democratic advocacy. The Corporate Mapping Project shines a bright light on the fossil fuel industry by investigating the ways in which corporate power is organized and exercised. Hosted here at UVic, the initiative is a partnership of academic and community-based researchers and advisors. The CMP focuses on mapping how power and influence play out in the oil, gas, and coal industries. We are also mapping the wider connections that link Canada's fossil fuel sector to other economic sectors and to other parts of society. Now, a map, of course, is a guide that helps us find our way across terrain that can be disorienting, even treacherous. Through mapping, we want to make corporate power and influence visible. Doing so can support workers, indigenous communities, civil society organizations, and concerned citizens in their efforts to reshape our economy along more democratic and environmentally sustainable lines. Um, our mapping, uh, I should mention, 
some of our partners. As I say, uh, the, the project is hosted at the University of Victoria, but we have uh, a number of university partners as well as civil society partners with the CCPA playing a very important role. Um, now, our efforts are focused around four research questions, each motivated, um, uh, each directing a different stream of research. So we have, as a first question, how is economic power organized in and around the fossil fuel sector? How does that power reach into political and cultural life? How is corporate power wielded at ground level from fossil fuel extraction, digging it out of the ground, to and transport right through to final consumption? And then finally, how can we build capacity for citizen monitoring of corporate power and influence while expanding the space for democratic discussion? To answer these questions, we have, um, we do all sorts of things. We publish um, research reports, all of these are available uh, on our website, and uh, shorter blog posts you can see in the middle here, this, um, uh, the uh, James Rose piece on the University of Victoria, outing UVic as it seeks to profit um, from uh, Exxon, the Exxon connection in terms of um, uh, the, uh, 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 the, fun, the this is part of the um, um, uh, campaign to try to uh, defund the oil um, sector, uh, in particular in terms of UVic's uh, investments in um, in the oil sector, which are which are fairly substantial in various ways. Um, then we uh, have produced a documentary, Crude Power, with our partners, and um, and we organize various public talks and conferences. So. Um, we're fairly busy in trying to both do the research and really get the word out about, um, about issues of corporate power and uh, the climate crisis. We know that the climate crisis requires us to make a transition away from fossil fuels. Everybody knows that. The questions really are, what sort of transition and how quickly? The answers hinge significantly on whether indigenous people, workers, and environmentalists are able to counter the power and influence of the fossil fuel sector. We and our partners in the Corporate Mapping Project are trying to provide the kinds of knowledge that can help fuel a just and timely transition. So let me get on to this question of corporate power and how it manifests itself, because of course it manifests itself in many different ways. We can talk about networks of economic elites and networks of capital ownership and finance and power, um, uh, over labor at the point of production, managerial power, so on and so forth. Lots of different kinds of power. Um, analytically, we can distinguish three overlapping spheres in which this power is organized and exercised. So we have economic sphere, of course, but then the, the kind of corporate power that reaches into civil society and um, political society. Um, so. What I want to do is run through some of our findings so far to give you a sense of the challenges that we actually face. First, some findings on the question of corporate power's economic face, and then concerning its political and cultural reach. Now, corporate power's economic face involves the entire process through which capital grows and accumulates from extraction of carbon and other resources through manufacturing, transport, to marketing, finance, and consumption. There are several modalities of economic power. First of all, operational power is the power of management flowing through a chain of command, top to bottom, to shop floor, in the appropriation of economic surplus. But it is also wielded along commodity chains uh, from resource extraction right through to final uh, distribution and consumption again. In Canada, bitumen represents four-fifths of all extractable oil, and five large companies control most of the action, with two additional firms dominating the continental pipeline infrastructure. Within them and across the pipelines that flow mostly north to south, the operational power of management controls labor processes that are highly capital intensive and fast becoming more automated through driverless trucks and the like. Now, 
strategic power, strategic control, is the power to set business strategies. This involves control of the corporation itself, right? Often by owning the largest block of shares. Our mapping of share ownership of leading Canada-based fossil capital corporations reveals um, a confluence of ownership by wealthy Canadian families, uh, transnational parent corporations like ExxonMobil, and financial institutions that include Canada's big five banks and the world's major asset managers. These ownership relations are arrayed in a network of many small institutional holdings and a few dozen large holdings that confer strategic control upon their corporate or personal owners. The concentration of fossil capital and its ownership and control represents a massive centralization of economic power in the hands of private investors accountable only to themselves. Finally, allocative power is the power of finance. This power which accrues to financial institutions is crucial in expanding or retooling operations, launching takeover bids, coping with cash squeezes, and so on and so forth. Canada's financial sector is dominated by five big banks. And it turns out they own each other. Each owns substantial stakes in the other. For instance, 22% of Scotiabank is owned by the other four banks. All of Canada's biggest banks rank among the top international lenders to fossil capital, according to Rainforest Action Network, with, as you can see, the Royal Bank ranked number two in the world, and Toronto Dominion is ranked number six globally. This graphic also depicts the hegemonic face of corporate power, the legitimation of that power, primarily in the political and cultural fields. Now, here's a more elaborate diagram of the two forms of corporate power, the, uh, the economic form of power that's really caught up in the accumulation of capital itself, and the, the, the hegemonic form of power, which is more political and cultural. Um, now, uh, hegemonic power then refers to how consent is secured, organized, and maintained from the visceral level of everyday life, people just living their lives, right up to the top tiers of state and intergovernmental institutions. Indeed, the power of fossil capital extends beyond economic relations of managerial ownership and financial power. Shannon Daub and I have put it this way, the clash between business as usual and a just post-carbon future is equally a struggle for hearts and minds. A key resource in this struggle is the cohesiveness of the corporate community as leading capitalists and their advisors interact frequently, maintaining a sense of solidarity and common purpose, even as they compete over the division of spoils appropriated from labor and nature. When we focus on this issue of cohesiveness, we find that a dense network of interlocking directorates, directors serving on each other's corporate boards, right, among Canada's leading fossil capital companies, pulls together capitalists and their advisors as an integrated elite. The corporate community's cohesiveness enables corporate capital to reach a consensus on long-term goals and vision and on that basis, to speak politically with a single voice and lead. Network analytic findings from our project make this clear. In this complex diagram, we can see that the dense core of the fossil capital elite is centered in Calgary. All of these are Calgary-based corporations, but one, I think. And they're, all they're all in the fossil capital sector, oil and gas. And um, basically, uh, uh, they, they form a highly integrated local network in Calgary. This is, a, this is really the center of the Calgary business community. Um, uh, a highly networked elite uh, community. But the Calgary business community uh, is, of course, part of a national business community. So this is the Calgary community here. The black dots are all fossil capital companies. They're highly interlocked with each other, but they also share directors with the Toronto-based uh, corporate community, which is mostly these, these white dots, which are the financial institutions. So this is Calgary-Toronto axis, and as you can see, the other cities of Canada are also integrated into this rather regionalized national 
elite network. The Canadian national network is in, in turn embedded in a transnational elite network of capitalists that includes major corporations based in Europe, Asia, and the United States. But as I've said, the power of fossil capital reaches, it extends beyond the corporate sector itself. And this includes, of course, the Koch brothers and their reach right within the United States and sometimes reaching a bit into Canada um, in some interesting ways. So complementing elite integration is the reach of corporate power into the public sphere, shaping the institutions, agendas, policies, discourses, and values that add up to an entire way of life. In a study that recently appeared in the Canadian Review of Sociology, we map elite relations between the largest Canada-based fossil capital firms and several knowledge-producing sectors. Each sector produces and circulates ideas that inform public discourse and policy from distinct locations and indistinct ways. In our mapping of corporate reach, we include industry associations like the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, business advocacy groups like the Business Council of Canada that define and advance business interests. We also include um, business-sponsored think tanks like the Fraser Institute that focus on producing evidence-based commentary and analysis from a standpoint compatible with business interests. And thirdly, universities and research institutes which produce both knowledge and knowledgeable people for corporate business and liberal society. What we find is a pervasive pattern of carbon sector reach into these domains, forming a single integrated elite network centered in Alberta, yet linked to the central Canadian corporate elite in various ways. The largest fossil fuel firms are particularly engaged as are civil society organizations that produce and circulate various kinds of knowledge from the strategic communications of Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers and the Business Council of BC and other groups through the policy analyses and prescriptions of the Fraser Institute and the C.D. Howe Institute to the academic and scientific knowledge produced at places like the University of Calgary and other universities and research institutes. Now we can sum up the state of play as elite cohesion paired with exclusion of voices from other social sectors. The many threads of communication and collaboration in civil society afforded by the elite network enable fossil capital to define, defend, and advance its profit-driven concerns as simply the public interest. Right? This architecture enables a soft denial regime that acknowledges climate change while protecting the continued flow of profit. What obstructs serious action are corporate interests expressed in part through the intricate elite network that reaches from fossil capital boardrooms into civil society, also into political society. Now these elite networks are complemented by what Shane Gunster and his colleagues term emergent online networks of extractivist populism. Some of them directly funded by big carbon. A good example is the online initiative that the oil and gas industry has mounted through its trade association, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. CAP owns and operates Energy Citizens, right? This is a website that trumpets the goodness of fossil capital and invites each of us to use our own online resources to support this important national cause. CAP's Energy Citizens homepage features a hard-hatted woman of color posing in a bitumen mine. She looks earnestly into our eyes, accompanied by the caption, fight for our future, implying that workers, including disadvantaged minorities, are on the front line of an epic struggle that needs our support. Now, besides reassuring us that big carbon has our interests in hand, the Energy Citizens site is a vehicle for activating astroturf collectivism. The point of it all is for citizens to protect the national interest by speaking out. The site enables each of us to pledge our support for new pipelines and Canadian oil rather than letting foreign oil take over 
as if those are the only options. In this imaginary, our interests and identities merge with those of Canadian fossil capital. We're all energy citizens. By going online to take cap-generated pledges to recruit friends as energy citizens, we can spread the word. Now, going back again to our framework on corporate power, we've also examined how big carbon exerts influence in a political sense more directly. This often involves elite networks that reach into government. In a study published recently in the Canadian Journal of Communication, Shannon Dobb and her co-authors analyze industry submissions to the climate leadership panels. You might remember these climate leadership panels. Recommended policy in Alberta and British Columbia in 2015, in Alberta 2016, in BC. Industry submissions to the panels emphasize the need to stoke economic growth and international competitiveness while gently reducing emissions. Both governments incorporated these recommendations into their climate plans, ignoring more robust options such as asset retirement and removal of fossil fuel subsidies, which are enormous. Our research exposed the BC process in particular as a textbook example of institutional corruption. In BC, the Climate Leadership Panel's 32 recommendations were completely ignored by the Liberal government. Indeed, the 2016 policy was hatched at CAP's Calgary office as the BC government coordinated a secret three-month-long consultation with industry to write the actual plan. Despite the appearance of public consultation, climate policy in both provinces promotes a new denialism that normalizes the primacy of the market and the inevitability of carbon-based economic growth. So these are some of the ways in which fossil capital power reaches into civil and political society. But others, uh, to briefly um, run down a few of them, um, include incessant corporate lobbying of governments and support for pro-business political parties. Um, corporate capture of state-mandated regulatory bodies. Everybody knows about the National Energy Board and the scandals around its near total uh, capture by uh, the fossil fuel industry. Um, revolving doors through which business leaders and advisors, be advisors become political leaders and vice versa, right, moving back and forth. And of course, corporate philanthropy in industry towns uh, combining with corporate social responsibility campaigns that persuade communities to see their fate and industry's fate as inextricably linked. Now, in combination, these practices and relations form a regime of obstruction, extending from the economic to the political and cultural, and also from everyday life to the global. As it reaches into the public sphere, Concentrated corporate power distorts communication, degrading democracy, and privileging the perspectives of those who own and control capital. A final aspect of corporate reach into political society aligns corporations with the repressive arm of the state as co-managers of dissent and surveillance. When hegemony fails, when dissent becomes well-organized, and potentially effective, the state turns to more repressive means of social control. Vis-a-vis -vis fossil capital, this began to happen under the Harper regime, as coalitions of indigenous environmental and social justice activists rose up in opposition to proposed pipelines, such as Northern Gateway and Keystone XL. So what was the state response? Well, it was to mobilize its security agencies in partnership with top fossil fuel corporations to protect what they call strategic infrastructure. The Trudeau government, the Bill C-59, continues to target strategic infrastructure, interference with critical infrastructure as a threat to national security and to allow preventative arrest of protesters within a framework of partnership between state and corporate owners. 
Meanwhile, in the US, eight states are now considering bills that would hypercriminalize protests on property owned by the fossil fuel industry. So this last power modality reminds us that although corporate power in the political field relies mainly on persuasion, its persuasive efforts are armored with coercion. Now, at the Corporate Mapping Project, we're collaborating closely with fossil capital's critics in the struggle for a world beyond fossil capitalism. One of our current initiatives is an online interactive database through which activists, journalists, social scientists, and concerned citizens can map corporate power in and around Canada's carbon extractive sector. In this, we're working very closely with our partner, the Public Accountability Initiative, which runs LittleSys, an involuntary Facebook of the corporate and political elites in the United States. Through its network drawing app, Oligrapher, LittleSys makes it easy to map the power, very interactive kind of uh, database that LittleSys has set up. Our online mapping tool to be launched in a few weeks will link into LittleSys's data, but will focus on Canada's carbon extractive sector the emitters, as well as the organizations that serve as enablers and legitimators for fossil capital in Canada. Now, as a complement to um, this kind of network drawing tool um, that we're going to be putting on the uh, internet fairly soon, uh, as, as part of that whole initiative, we are picking up on a favorite device that the business press uses, right? The top 500, the top 100, whatever. Um, we're currently compiling the top 50. Our top 50 differs, however, from the fawning tributes in the Financial Post or Fortune magazine. We target Canada's top climate culprits. So our approach redeploys the hegemonic notion of a top 500 or top 25, but torques it in a critical direction, calling attention to the principal agents in Canada's regime of obstruction, I'm trying to out them. right? And, and raise consciousness about who these principal agents are. So we include, of course, as emitters, the main producers and distributors of fossil fuels. In 2016, the 10 leading producers accounted for almost two thirds of the oil pumped by Canada's 100 leading oil and gas firms. As for the key organizations that enable fossil capital to conduct business as usual, we're focusing on two types of enablers. Um, we are looking, of course, at financial institutions like Manual Life and the big banks, but also at um, the captured regulators, the National Energy Board, Alberta Energy Regulator, and of course, BC's own um, regulatory body. Um, these bodies are often headed by industry insiders. They're often captured in various ways, actually. They green light new projects and tend to turn a blind eye to environmental concerns. Finally, legitimators in the top 50 are a diverse category of civil society-based organizations, including industry groups such as CAP and business councils, advocacy groups, think tanks, you can see the Fraser Institute there, and, uh, and other, uh, other organizations uh, uh, that are mainly in uh, civil society. Such organizations persuade the general public and political elites that business as usual must continue that any big shift away from carbon is unfeasible or unnecessary. We've been working up case study profiles of each top 50 organization, which will live on our website, providing useful information to activists, journalists, and concerned citizens. The top 50 um, is one of our key initiatives in public sociology. Each top 50 organization will have this kind of profile with lots of information about its uh, its practices and connections and so on. The point is to combine critical social science here with a rhetorical strategy that outs the fossil capital oligarchy, uh, the organizations that maintain the current regime. So let me move to a conclusion, and uh, a conclusion that is meant to be a hopeful conclusion, because I mean, you know, we're in difficult times for sure, but they're not without uh, any kind of hopeful signs. <laughs> The various modalities of corporate power can be placed within a wider framework that recognizes that power implies resistance. Resistance to fossil capital takes many forms, 
such as these. So these are just a, a smattering of them. But for fossil capital's adversaries, the challenge is to go beyond a politics of resistance. And for the corporate mapping project, beyond outing the fossil oligarchy. In the second half of our partnership, we are continuing to map the power, but we're also exploring solutions. This means outflanking the technological, technocratic, market-based solutions that leave corporate power intact and proposing alternatives that capture the public's imagination. So what is the climate justice alternative to Big Carbon's regime of obstruction? It involves a double power shift, which runs against the interests of large corporations invested in fossil fuels. So energy democracy that, that, that sums up this double power shift um, neatly um, combines the idea of a shift from fossil fuel power to renewables, that's one shift, but at the same time, a shift from corporate oligarchy to democratic control of economic decisions. If we're going to change our energy systems, let's make a change that's not just a technical change, let's make a social justice change. That's the idea in energy democracy. A feasible and just alternative to the oligarchic organization of fossil capitalism Energy democracy has been endorsed by the international trade union movement, including um, the Canadian Labor Congress, and through trade unions for energy democracy. Energy democracy's three overarching goals, resisting fossil fuel dominant energy agenda, while reclaiming and dem democratically restructuring energy regimes, inform a strategy that connects the dots between divestment initiatives First Nations protectors, anti-fracking protests, community solar projects, and so on. As a recent discussion of energy democracy at Amsterdam's Transnational Institute concluded, what is actually needed is a power shift over all aspects of energy to a socially just energy system that works in the public interest, along with a rapid transition to low and eventually zero carbon that is renewable energy. Now, as Sean Sweeney and John Treat conclude in their recent review of this emerging field, a just transition is possible, but it will have to be demanded and driven forward by a broad democratic movement with unions playing a key role. There is evidence that such a movement of movements is emerging. Leading NGOs have recently created an open space for groups fighting for energy democracy, where these core principles are presented. Uh, universal access and social justice, renewable and sustainable local energy, public and social ownership, fair play and creation of green jobs, which of course means that the workers in this transition are guaranteed the jobs in the renewable energy sector are created unionized and fairly paid. Very important in a just transition strategy. Um, and finally, as a, as a fourth uh, crucial aspect uh, to this conception of energy democracy, democratic control and participation, empowering citizens and workers to participate in energy policy by democratizing governance and instituting complete transparency. Well, we can recognize in energy democracy a project that is both ethical, political, and economic, ecological, and that resonates with the concerns of several intersecting movements. We need to think of energy democracy as a multiscalar climate justice initiative extending from everyday life right up to global organization. In everyday life, politically informed lifestyle changes and informal networks that reject fossil fuel consumerism can foster attitudinal shifts and build support, build the, the base for broader transformations. Everyday life is very important as a site uh, of uh, building energy democracy. Within local communities, it's sort of the second line in this table here, uh, free public transit is a good example. 
Decarbonization, decommodification of public transit can have a similar impact, as can practices such as community gardening that open alternatives to industrial agriculture. Uh, within institutions, there's much work to do. And the recently relaunched uh, Divest UVic, um, down here, is a good example of a, of a local institutional initiative uh, that is working in this direction. Across Canada, of course, LEAP, both the manifesto and the movement uh, it has spawned is a significant intervention in redefining the national interest, which explicitly uses energy democracy um, as its frame. The LEAP movement originated in Canada, but it has gained international traction. In fact, many groups are leading the way toward democratization and decolonization as a response to business as usual. Here are just a few. You probably know about some of these groups, like Dogwood is Victoria-based, very important uh, social justice and environmental group here in BC. Um, the Indigenous um, Climate Action uh, uh, is a, uh, an important um, group that strives to uplift indigenous worldviews and experiences within climate discussions, working towards true climate justice, as they say, which must include indigenous rights 350.org um, is an international environmental organization dedicated to building the climate movement around three operating principles, climate justice, collaboration in diverse coalitions, and mass mobilizations to force change upon governments that currently are in the pocket of fossil capital, such as Canada's. The challenge is to articulate these social forces into a coherent system of alliances and solidarities. Such a formation requires dialectical, sorry, dialogical engagement among all affected parties. To encompass a deep transformation, the alliances must extend widely. In view of the foundational relationship in Canada between colonialism and capitalism, Decarbonization and democratization must be conjoined with decolonization, enhancing capacities for indigenous self-determination. By the same token, the close symbiosis between energy and finance means that robust energy democracy must bring the financial sector itself under democratic control. Much the same can be said of the uh, the, section, uh, the, the sector of media, the need to undo hegemonic corporate power within communications to remake media along democratic lines. For political theorist Andre Gors, non-reformist reforms are steps toward system change, which avoid co-optation by disturbing the status quo in ways that build popular power. Very important concept, non-reformist reform. Energy democracy is, in this sense, a bundle of non-reformist reforms that can open space for democratization and decolonization of economic, political, and cultural life. In such a transformation, corporate power would give way to popular power and participatory planning in production and allocation to environmental stewardship and authentic reconciliation, to public communication and inclusive community development. To address the modalities of uh, corporate power that make up the regime of obstruction, energy democracy needs to be developed in, in concert with other non-reformist reforms to decolonize Canada, to democratize workplaces, finance, and cultural production. So this is a bundle of non-reformist reforms that can lead to potentially more non-reformist reforms that move us in the direction of economic democracy um, and uh, ecological sanity. So to return to my open que opening question, can we make a just transition from fossil capitalism? I think we can venture a definite maybe. <laughs> and, our research suggests that change on the scale and pace needed 
will not come from the top. It ain't going to happen. That's not how it's going to happen. Our research suggests instead that much depends on how effectively democratic movements for uh, climate justice can slow down fossil capital's rate of destruction, which is what resistance and direct action, when successful, accomplish. I want to take a little snippet from Tom Hayden, leader of the American uh, student movement and new left in the 1960s, passed away not long ago. But before he passed away, at the conclusion of the 1999 battle in Seattle that some of you no doubt remember, um, Canadians were quite involved in that as well, uh, Tom Hayden gave quite a nice little speech, lasts for two minutes, I've got it, I've got it. we're going to watch it. And in Seattle, as we recall, thousands of anti-corporate globalization protesters shut down the WTO. They shut down the ministerial meeting that was going to take the WTO to its next quantum leap in capitalist globalization. They effectively derailed one aspect of capitalist globalization, however, temporarily. Hayden celebrated the victory, but he also pointed to the need to go beyond resistance to speed up the rate of creation, as he puts it, as you will see, the rate of creation of a new world. So here's the clip. Um, and uh, if I can get this thing to work. Yes, it should work. Come on. I never thought. I never thought. The time would come. The time would come. That a new generation of activists. A new generation of activists. Would part the waters. Would part the waters. The waters in which your idealism is supposed to be drowned. The waters in which your idealism is supposed to be drowned. And come to the surface. And come to the surface. Smiling. Smiling. Fighting. Fighting. Laughing. Laughing. Dancing. Dancing. Marching. Marching. Committing soul disobedience. Committing soul disobedience. Renewing American democracy. Okay, so two decades on, as yet another generation of activists comes of age, we can appreciate the wisdom of Hayden's advice. We need to resist, but we need to create, and particularly in indigenous contexts, to revive ways of life that are socially just and ecologically sane. The urgent struggle for a world beyond fossil capital may be the leading edge of convergent movements to create a just, an ecologically vibrant world beyond corporate power itself. Now, almost four years ago, just when the corporate mapping project was getting started, I created this music video, which I'm going to subject you to. I wrote a song. Actually, the song was written exactly four years ago. Um, and the song is called 400 Parts Per Million, because at that time, four years ago, the Earth passed that bar of 400 parts of carbon dioxide gas per million uh, uh, molecules in the atmosphere. Uh, that's considered really dangerous. Like 350 is considered safe. That's why 350.org is called 350.org. 400 is already in a very dangerous zone. We're now at 411, by the way, four years later. Um, so anyway, I decided to write this uh, this song, it basically condenses what I've just conveyed in an hour of lecturing. 
um, into a three-minute blues song. Um, and I got uh, major help from my son, Wes, who's a musician, and he's sitting over there, I think, um, and he's an alumnus of the Social Justice Studies program here at UBIC. So very, very nice to have uh, Wes involved in this project. Um, I hope you like it. It's, you know, it's a do-it-yourself kind of thing, but um, it's, um, uh, it is what it is. And um, I think it, it does sort of um, relate to a lot of what I've just been um, trying to explain to you. The oceans keep rising and the weather's getting more extreme. African sizzling, pull the caps of losing their sheep. Four hundred parts per million and the future's looking hungry and lean. Soft denials now to the status quo. A techno silver bullet nicely placed will let our footprint grow. Four hundred feet PM, we should have quit this scene a long time ago. Thank you. 